Marxism and the Oppression of Women Section Engels, A Defective Formulation Having arrived in 1850 as an exile from the political storms on the continent, Engels remained in Manchester for two decades, employed in the family textile firm, continually in financial difficulty during these years. In 1870, on the eve of the Paris Commune, and with developments in the international quickening, Engels liquidated his partnership in the business and moved to London, where he could more fully participate in political life. Until Marx's death in 1883, the two friends worked side by side in the socialist movement, daily discussing every aspect of their political and theoretical work. With Marx, Engels sat on the General Council of the International and worked to unify the various trends within the socialist movement. And like Marx, he played the part of dean and advisor to the movement after the International's collapse, continuing in this function up to his death in 1895. During these last 20 years of his life, Engels also embarked on a wide-ranging program of research and writing. Among his published works, two well-known and extremely popular books touch on the problem of women's oppression. Together with the Communist Manifesto, these texts acted as fundamental guides for the emerging generation of socialists. Engels produced the work that became known as anti in 1878 as a polemic against the views of the socialist Eugène Durung. The book presents a comprehensive exposition of what Engels saw as the communist world outlook fought for by Marx and myself. Naturally enough, that outlook included some comments on women, the family, and the reproduction of the working class which generally recapitulate his own and Marx's earlier analyses and positions. In a survey of pre-Marxist socialist thinkers, for instance, Engels approves Fourier's critique of the relations between the sexes and of women's position in capitalist society, and asserts, following Marx's free paraphrase of Fourier in The Holy Family, that the utopian socialist was the first to regard women's position as an index of general social development. Engels also reviews a number of themes discussed in previous works, the determination of the value of labor power, the effects of machinery on the working class family, the emergence of an industrial reserve army, the character of bourgeois marriage as a legal form of prostitution, and the progressive dissolution of traditional family bonds, including, quote, patriarchal subordination with the advance of capitalism. Looking at the family in earlier societies, Engels speaks of, quote, the natural division of labor within the family, and with some qualification, subsumes all members of a household under its male head. Finally, Engels insists that family forms are rooted in social relations, and thus that the family can change if society is transformed. In this context, he draws a critical programmatic corollary from Marx's statement in Capital that capitalism creates the foundation for such changes. What is necessary is not only, quote, the free association of men, but the transformation of private domestic work into public industry. This is the first formulation within the classical Marxist tradition of a position later to become a central tenet of socialist strategy. Footnote. The question of changes in the organization of domestic labor had, of course, long been a concern among utopian thinkers. See, for example, Hayden. End footnote. Engels' other major book from this period is the famous The Origin of the Family, Private Property, and the State, written between March and May of 1884, published that October, and instantaneously accorded the place of a socialist classic. The circumstances of Engels' startlingly rapid production of The Origin remain somewhat mysterious. The book is based, as its subtitle, in the light of the researches of Lewis H. Morgan, indicates, on Morgan's Ancient Society, which had appeared in 1877, and immediately engaged Marx's interest. Writing to the German socialist Kautsky on the 16th of February 1884, Engels described the late Marx's enthusiasm for Morgan's book, adding, quote, If I had the time, I would work up the material with Marx's notes, but I cannot even think of it. Yet, by late March, he was already at work on The Origin, and by the end of April, close to finishing. 
the full explanation of the reasons for Engel's change in plan, which is especially striking in view of the fact that he was already immersed in the editing of Marx's unfinished volumes of Capital, must await further research. It seems likely that the context was political. In 1879, the German socialist leader August Bebel had published Woman in the Past, Present, and Future, which appeared in a revised version in late 1883. Tremendously popular from the start, Bebel's Woman bore the influence of utopian socialism throughout. In addition, it reflected emerging tendencies towards reformism within the socialist movement. Engel's decision to write The Origin surely reflected a recognition of the weaknesses in Babel's work. The socialist movement's commitment to the liberation of women urgently required an adequate theoretical foundation. Understood as an implicit polemic within the movement, The Origin represented Engel's attempt to provide one. Footnote. For the publication history and a critique of Auguste Babel's Woman and Socialism, see Chapter 7. End footnote. The socialist tradition has treated the origin as the definitive Marxist pronouncement on the family, and therefore on the so-called woman question. Further, the tradition holds that the book accurately reflects the views of Marx as well as Engels. Neither assertion fairly measures the work's status. In the first place, the subject covered in the origin, as its title indicates, is the development not only of the family, but of private property and the state. The observation is important, for it suggests the book's limited goals with respect to the issue of women's subordination. Rather than provide a comprehensive analysis of women, the family, and the reproduction of the working class, the origin seeks simply to situate certain aspects of the question securely in a historical and theoretical context. In the second place, the origin bears the scars of its hasty genesis throughout. Far from the work of either Marx or Engels at his best, it constitutes, in Engels' words, quote, a meager substitute for what my departed friend no longer had the time to do. End quote. Footnote. Important critical evaluations of the origin include Brown, Delmar, Draper, Heinus and Hurst, Crater, Lane, Leacock, Sachs, Santa Maria, Stern. End footnote. In drafting the origin, Engels relied not just on Morgan's ancient society, but on a series of notebooks in which Marx had entered passages from various authors' writings concerning primitive society. These, quote, ethnological notebooks, composed in 1880-1, to include a lengthy abstract of Morgan's book. It is not at all clear what Marx intended to do with the material he was collecting, and Engels altered the framework established in the notebooks to some extent. To grasp the structure and meaning of Engels' book, it is, therefore, necessary to examine the contents, theoretical assumptions, and weaknesses of Morgan's ancient society. Footnote. Of many subsequent reprint editions, the most useful is Leacock, 1963. End footnote. In Ancient Society, Morgan, an American anthropologist living in northern New York State, seeks to demonstrate the strikingly parallel evolution of what he saw as four essential characteristics of human society, inventions and discoveries, government, family, and property. The book organizes a vast array of ethnographic data into sections corresponding to these four characteristics, labeled by Morgan, quote, lines of human progress from savagery through barbarism to civilization. Part 1, a short survey entitled, quote, Growth of Intelligence Through Inventions and Discoveries, grounds Morgan's evolutionary periodization in three major stages of the development of the arts of subsistence. At the most primitive level of human social organization, peoples in the stage of, quote, savagery, what anthropologists today call hunting and gathering, or foraging, cultures, obtain subsistence by gathering wild plants, fishing, and hunting. The second period, quote, barbarism, is characterized by food production, as opposed to the food gathering typical of savagery. Cultures at the lower levels of barbarism practice horticulture, a simple type of plant domestication. 
In the upper stages of barbarism, animals are domesticated, and a more sophisticated agriculture, which includes the use of the plow and irrigation, develops. Finally, in the period of, quote, civilization, societies base themselves on these advanced agricultural methods, to which they add writing and the keeping of records. Morgan divides such societies into two broad types, ancient and modern. With this sequence of stages, Morgan rests all human history on a materialist foundation, but one whose essence is technological, not social. Morgan devotes nearly two-thirds of ancient society to part two, quote, growth of the idea of government. Here he presents a theory of the evolution of social organization from early kin-based forms to fully developed political governance. The social organization of the most primitive peoples is based simply on broadly defined, quote, classes of persons permitted to marry one another. As the circle of possible marriage partners narrows, the, quote, gens, or clan, develops. A clan consists of persons related through one parental line only. In a, quote, gentile society, that is, one organized on the basis of clans, an individual belongs to the clan of either mother or father, not to both. Marriage must ordinarily be to someone outside one's own clan. Where property exists, it is retained within the clan upon the death of a member. The fundamental social unit, therefore, is the clan, either matrilineal or patrilineal. The couple bond cannot have the central structural role it later acquires for it links persons whose major allegiances are to distinct clans. Morgan shows that the Gentile, or clan, system provides the foundation for quite complex types of social organization. Clans may be grouped in larger units, called fratries, and these in turn may join to form tribes. In the clan system's most developed form, which Morgan believed he had observed among the Iroquois Indians, Several tribes constitute a confederacy, or nation, able to include thousands of members over a vast geographical area, yet lacking formal political institutions, and still based on personal ties. In the latest stages of barbarism, technological advances in productivity render society so complex that clan organization must give way. The city develops bring heightened requirements at the level of governments not solvable by the clan system. Property, while not a new phenomenon, attains a dominant role. Henceforth, the creation and protection of property became the primary objects of the government. End quote. In place of the clan system, step the institutions of political organization, for government can no longer rest on personal relations. Morgan sketches the early evolution of the state, which organizes people, now distributed in property classes, on a territorial basis. Taking Rome as his example, he cites three principal changes that mark the shift from Gentile to political society. First, a system of classes based on property replaces the clan organization. Second, instead of government by means of a democratic tribal council, an assembly dominated by the property classes holds, and soon extends, political power. Third, territorial areas, rather than kin-based clans, fratries, or tribes, become the units of government. Even before the emergence of developed political organization, a critical change occurred within the clan system. At a certain point, matrilineal clan organization succumbed to the principle of patrilineality, under the impetus of the development of property. According to Morgan, descent through the female line was the original form of clan organization, because of its biological certainty. However, as soon as property in cattle and land emerged, two facts, entirely self-evident in Morgan's view, meant that, quote, descent in the female line was certain of overthrow and the substitution of the male line equally assured." End quote. First, men naturally became the owners of the property. Second, they developed a natural wish to transmit it to their own children. Hence, in the middle stages of barbarism, the accumulation of property has the consequence 
that the patrilineal clan becomes the basic unit of the Gentile social system. Part 3, entitled, quote, Growth of the Idea of the Family, makes up roughly one quarter of ancient society. Emphasizing that the form of the family is highly variable, Morgan traces its evolution through five stages. Progressive restriction of permissible marriage partners constitutes the basis of the development. In the first type of family, the, quote, consanguine, sisters and female cousins are married, as a group, to their brothers and male cousins. The next family type, the Punaluan, modifies the first by prohibiting marriage between own brothers and sisters. These two forms of group marriage, which suggest an even earlier stage of promiscuous intercourse, represent conjectural forms, reconstructed by Morgan on the basis of his understanding of kin terminology, and broadly corresponding to the stages of savagery and early barbarism. The third form, the, quote, syndiasmian, or pairing, family, is founded on marriage between single pairs, who live within communal households, and whose bond may be dissolved at the will of either partner. The pairing family constitutes the family type associated with clan-based societies. Lineage ties remain primary to each partner, for the clan is the basic social unit and takes final responsibility for its members. Morgan notes the measure of collective security provided to individuals by this system, as well as its relative egalitarianism when compared with subsequent family forms. The last two family types reflect the influence of the development of property. The, quote, patriarchal family organizes a group of persons, slave, servant, and free, under a male head who exercises supreme authority. The, quote, monogamian family is based on the marriage of a single couple which, with its children, composes an independent household. Morgan conceptualizes both family types as institutions whose primary purpose is to hold property and transmit it exclusively to their offspring. To ensure the children's paternity, strict fidelity is required of women. Paternal power is more or less absolute, and only death can break the marriage bond. The patriarchal and monogamy in families, therefore, stand in total opposition to clan organization. They are forms more appropriate for political society, and they appear in the last stages of barbarism and continue into the period of civilization. Morgan argues that the patriarchal and monogamy in families represent a social advance, for they permit a heightened individuality of persons. At the same time, he recognizes that, in practice, such individuality was available to men only. Women, as well as children, were generally subordinated to the paternal power of the family head. By contrast, the pairing family of clan society had provided women with a certain level of relative equality and power, particularly before the transition to patrilineal descent. So long as children remained in their mother's clan, the pairing family was embedded in the matrilineal clan household, and Morgan thought it likely that the woman, rather than the man, functioned as the family center. With the shift to descent in the male line, the pairing family became part of the patrilineal clan household, and the woman was more isolated from her gentile kin. This change, quote, operated powerfully to lower her position and arrest her progress in the social scale. But the woman was still a member of her own clan, and thus retained a substantial measure of independent social standing. The advent of paternal power in the patriarchal and monogamy in families opens the way to a much more profound degradation of women's position. Here, the cruel subordination of women and children belies Morgan's optimistic notions of evolutionary development. He presents the material honestly, however, heartened by a faith that monogamy is, in principle at least, the highest and most egalitarian form of the family. Nevertheless, the empirical evidence stands in contradiction to Morgan's own commitment to a progressivist theory of evolution. It fell to Engels in The Origin to suggest a more adequate theoretical framework. 
Ancient Society closes with Part 4, entitled Growth of the Idea of Property, in which Morgan summarizes his understanding of social development. He distinguishes three stages in the development of property, generally corresponding to the three major evolutionary periods. Among the most primitive peoples, those at the level of savagery, property scarcely exists. Lands are held in common, as is housing, and Morgan speculates that the germ of property lies in a developing right to inherit personal articles. Property in land, houses, and livestock emerges in the stage of barbarism. The rules of inheritance at first conform to clan organization. Property reverts to the clan of the deceased, not to his or her spouse. Eventually, individual ownership through the monogamy and family prevails, with property inherited by the deceased owner's children. The period of civilization has arrived. In conclusion, Morgan offers the observation that in his own time, property has become an, quote, unmanageable power. Society is on a collision course, and its disintegration is the logical consequence, quote, of a career of which property is the end and aim, because such a career contains the elements of self-destruction. Nevertheless, Morgan holds out hope for society's reconstruction on, quote, the next higher plane, where it will appear as, quote, a revival in a higher form of the liberty, equality, and fraternity of ancient clan society. Ancient Society is a monumental work. In it, Morgan solved the puzzle of clan organization, described the sequence of social institutions in evolutionary terms, and attempted to analyze the basis for their development. Published in 1877, the book became the foundation for all subsequent research on the history of early human societies, despite its many factual and interpretive errors. These shortcomings, as well as Morgan's substantial contributions, have been much discussed. Footnote. The starting point for any evaluation of Morgan's Ancient Society must be Leacock's Introduction to Ancient Society. End footnote. Here, the emphasis will be on Morgan's understanding of the mechanisms of social change. Morgan presents his material in parallel form, as four kinds of phenomena, quote, which extend themselves in parallel lines along the pathways of human progress from savagery to civilization, end quote. Very much the pragmatic scholar, he sticks close to the data and permits himself to generalize, but not to theorize. Thus, each line constitutes, quote, a natural as well as necessary sequence of progress. But the source of this necessity remains mysterious. Moreover, Morgan's discussion of the evolution of the family presupposes a grasp of the development of clan organization and vice versa. The extremely repetitive organization of ancient society reveals its author's inability to establish a clear theoretical relationship among the, quote, four classes of facts. A theory of social development lies implicit, nonetheless, in Morgan's work, frequently observing that, quote, the experience of mankind has run in nearly uniform channels. He proposes that the placement of the major markers in these channels is determined by the evolution of the arts of subsistence, that is, by the types of inventions and discoveries used to acquire or produce the means of subsistence. In short, human progress ultimately rests on technological advances in the mode of material life. Morgan acknowledges the critical role played by the development of property. Quote, it is impossible to overestimate the influence of property in the civilization of mankind. End quote. The need to transmit property to heirs underlay, in his view, the shift from matrilineal to patrilineal clan organization. Similarly, quote, property, as it increased in variety and amount, exercised a steady and constantly augmenting influence in the direction of monogamy, end quote. And it was the rise of new, quote, complicated wants, growing out of an accelerated accumulation of property, that brought about the dissolution of clan organization and its replacement by political society. But what is property and why is it a motivating force in social development? 
In Morgan's account, property consists of things, the objects of subsistence, but it is not embedded in any determinate network of social relations. Once the idea of property has germinated, it simply grows automatically, extending itself in both magnitude and complexity while nurturing the sequence of stages in the arts of subsistence. Quote, Commencing at zero in savagery, the passion for the possession of property, as the representative of accumulated subsistence, has now become dominant over the human mind in civilized races. End quote. For Morgan, a passion in the minds of men, namely greed, leads naturally to the evolution of property and, consequently, to social development in general. In the extracts of ancient society he made in, quote, ethnological notebooks, Marx revised Morgan's sequence of presentation. Morgan had begun with the evolution of the arts of subsistence, and then surveyed the parallel development of government, family, and property. Marx moved Morgan's long section on government to the end of his notes, and altered the relative amount of space given to each part. He reduced by half the discussion of the arts of subsistence and by a third the section on the family. At the same time, he extended, proportionally, the space given by Morgan to the consideration of property and government. In sum, Marx's notes rearrange Morgan's material as follows. Arts of subsistence, reduced. Family, reduced. Property, expanded. Government, slightly expanded. Through this reorganization, Marx perhaps sought to put Morgan's findings in a theoretically more coherent order. To the extent that Engels incorporated the material in ancient society into his origin, he adopted the organization of Marx's excerpts in the ethnological notebooks, making, however, several important structural changes. He did not devote a separate chapter to the subject of property. He greatly enlarged the relative importance of the chapter on the family, giving it almost as much space as he assigned to the chapters on the state. And he shifted the focus to the transition between barbarism and civilization, in accordance with his and Marx's interest in the emergence of the state. In this way, Engels converted Morgan's four, quote, lines of human progress into three sections, which make up the bulk of the origin. Substantively, Engels followed Morgan quite closely. He pruned the wealth of ethnographic evidence, even replacing it where his own studies offered more relevant data. He emphasized the points that most tellingly exposed the revised theoretical foundation he was seeking to establish. And he employed a more readable and often engagingly chatty literary style. In general, the origin seems to be a shorter, as well as a more focused and accessible version of ancient society. A closer examination of the ways in which Engels' presentation of the material differs from Morgan's reveals both the contributions and the limitations of the origin. In a short opening chapter, quote, Stages in Prehistoric Culture, Engels succinctly recapitulates Morgan's account of the evolution of three stages in the arts of subsistence. Emphasizing the richness and accuracy of the account, he also acknowledges a certain weakness. Quote, My sketch will seem flat and feeble compared with the picture to be unrolled at the end of our travels. End quote. Engels refers here to his plans to deepen Morgan's work by recasting it in the light of Marx's theory of social development. As it turns out, the origin remains far closer to ancient society than Engels intended. Chapter 2 The Family, constituting about one third of the origin presents a reworked and augmented version of Morgan's sequence of family types. Engels underscores the importance of Morgan's discovery of this history, and takes the opportunity to situate Morgan's work in the context of 18th and 19th century speculations concerning primate evolution, early human social behavior, and the possibility of a primitive state of promiscuous sexual intercourse. Concluding these half-dozen pages with the observations that bourgeois moral standards cannot be used to interpret primitive societies. He quickly summarizes and comments on Morgan's discussion of the two hypothetical forms of group marriage. Like Morgan, he believes that natural selection, 
through the innate mechanisms of jealousy and incest taboos, triggered the succession of family types. In addition, the logic behind the change Marx had made in Morgan's sequence of presentation now becomes clear. For Engels is able to explain the origin of the clan system in the course of his description of the Punaluan family. Having disposed of group marriage and the genesis of the clan, Engels turns to the pairing and patriarchal families. He selectively summarizes Morgan's findings, at the same time integrating material Morgan had covered in his chapter on property. Along with Morgan, Johann Jacob Bakovin, and others, Engels assumes that the supremacy of women characterized primitive societies, but he argues that it rested on the material foundation of a natural sex division of labor within the primitive communistic household. Only if, quote, new social forces caused that natural material foundation to take a different form could women lose their position of independence. And this occurred when society began to produce a sizable surplus, making it possible for wealth to amass and eventually pass into the private possession of families. Like Morgan, Engels sees the development of productivity as an automatically evolving process, but he makes a distinction, however vaguely, between wealth, a given accumulation of things, and private property, a social relation. Once wealth is held privately, its accumulation becomes a central social issue. Quote, mother right, that is, descent in the female line and, along with it, the supremacy of women in the communal household, now constitutes a barrier to social development. Earlier, the supposedly natural division of labor between women and men placed women in charge of the household, while men had the task of providing food. In a society at a low level of productivity, therefore, women possessed the household goods and men the instruments necessary to hunt, fish, cultivate plants, and the like. With increasing productivity and the development of private property and land, cattle, and slaves, this historical accident, as it were, has the grim consequence that men, the former possessors of the instruments of gathering and producing food, now own the wealth. Mother right makes it impossible, however, for men to transmit the newly evolved private property to their children. Quote, mother right, therefore, had to be overthrown, and overthrown it was. End quote. Engels regards the shift to the patrilineal clan system as pivotal in its impact on society and on women's position. It marks the establishment of a set of social relations conducive to the further evolution not only of private property, but of full-scale class society. More dramatically, quote, the overthrow of mother right was the world historic defeat of the female sex. The man took command in the home also. The woman was degraded and reduced to servitude. She became the slave of his lust and a mere instrument for the production of children, end quote. The patriarchal family, with its incorporation of slaves and servants under the supreme authority of the male head, now emerges as a form intermediate between the pairing family and monogamy. Engels offers specific historical examples of this transition stage, emphasizing the relationship between land tenure and social structure, as well as the brutality of the patriarch towards women in the household. In discussing the monogamous family, Engels again follows Morgan while simultaneously incorporating a clearer analysis of property relations, and focusing on the question of women's position. The monogamous family appears towards the end of the second stage in the development of the arts of subsistence, that is, at the threshold of civilization, and represents a perfected form for the transmission of private property from father to children. Engels emphasizes the origin of the monogamous family in economic conditions and its function as a property-holding institution. Quote, It was the first form of the family to be based not on natural, but on economic conditions, on the victory of private property over primitive, natural, communal property. End quote. Although Engels never states it unambiguously, the implication is that the form of the monogamous as well as the patriarchal family, constitutes a product of the rise of class society. 
Engels has no illusions about the position of women in the monogamous family. Monogamy is a standard enforced on the woman only, and it exists solely to guarantee the paternity of the offspring, not for any reasons of love or affection. Men remain free to live by a different standard. At the same time, the phenomenon of the neglected wife begets its own consequences. Thus, side by side with the institution of so-called monogamous marriage, flourishes all manner of adultery and prostitution. Furthermore, quote, monogamous marriage comes on the scene as the subjugation of the one sex by the other. It announces a struggle between the sexes unknown throughout the whole previous prehistoric period. End quote. In Engels' formulation, this struggle between the sexes appears simultaneously with class relations. Quote, the first class opposition that appears in history coincides with the development of the antagonism between man and woman in monogamous marriage, and the first class oppression coincides with that of the female sex by the male. End quote. Contrary to a common misinterpretation of these remarks, Engels does not assert that the sex struggle antedates class conflict. Neither, however, does he clearly argue that it is rooted in the emergence of class society. He simply treats the two developments as parallel, skirting the difficult problems of historical origins and theoretical relationships. With the basic character of monogamous marriage established, Engels turns briefly to a number of topics not addressed by Morgan. To start, he presents a quick history of the monogamous family's development in the period of civilization, with emphasis on the extent to which it fostered, quote, individual sex love. According to Engels, love-based marriages were impossible prior to the great, quote, moral advance constituted by the monogamous family. Moreover, in all ruling classes, even after the rise of the monogamous family, expedience rather than love governed the choice of marriage partner. After a brief glance at the medieval ruling class family, Engels focuses on marriage in capitalist society. Among the bourgeoisie, marriage is a matter of convenience, generally arranged by parents to further their property interests. By contrast, the proletariat has the opportunity to truly experience individual sex love. Among the proletariat, quote, all the foundations of typical monogamy are cleared away. Here, there is no property, for the preservation and inheritance of which monogamy and male supremacy were established. Hence, there is no incentive to make this male supremacy effective. Here, quite other personal and social conditions decide. End quote. Moreover, Engels believes that with the increasing employment of women in wage labor, and women's accompanying independence, no basis survives for any kind of male supremacy in the working class household, quote, except perhaps for something of the brutality towards women that has spread since the introduction of monogamy, end quote. Engels' optimism, shared by Marx and the socialist movement of the period, is problematic on three counts. First, it misses the significance of the working class household as an essential social unit, not for the holding of property, but for the reproduction of the working class itself. Second, it overlooks the ways in which a material basis for male supremacy is constituted within the proletarian household. And third, it vastly underestimates the variety of ideological and psychological factors that provide a continuing foundation for male supremacy in the working class family. Most of Engel's brief discussion on the situation of women within the family and capitalist society is framed in terms of the gap between formal and substantive equality. He begins with an analogy between the marriage contract and the labor contract. Both are freely entered into, juridically speaking, thereby making the partners equal on paper. This formal equality disguises, in the case of the labor contract, the differences in class position between the worker and the employer. The marriage contract involves a similar mystification, since, in the case of a propertied family, parents actually determine the choice of children's marriage partners. In fact, the legal equality of the partners in a marriage 
is in sharp contrast with their actual inequality. The issue here concerns the nature of the wife's labor within the household. The development of the patriarchal and monogamous families converts such family labor into a private service. As Engels put it, quote, the wife became the head servant, excluded from all participation in social production, end quote. Her work loses the public or socially necessary place it had held in earlier societies. Both excluded and, later, economically dependent, she therefore becomes subordinate. Only with large-scale capitalist industry, and only for the proletarian woman, does the possibility appear for re-entry into production. Yet this opportunity has a contradictory character, so long as capitalist relations endure. If the proletarian wife, quote, carries out her duties in the private service of her family, she remains excluded from public production and unable to earn. And if she wants to take part in public production and earn independently, she cannot carry out family duties. End quote. Engel's conclusions regarding the conditions for women's liberation, summarized in a few paragraphs, generally converge with the equally brief remarks on the subject made by Marx in Capital. Like Marx, Engels underscores the progressive role that participation in the collective labor process can potentially play, and its crucial importance as a condition for human liberation. Whereas Marx had embedded his comments in an analysis of the historical impact of capitalist large-scale industry, Engels places his observations in the context of a discussion of political rights. He again draws an analogy between workers and women, arguing that both groups must have legal equality if they are to understand the character of their respective fights for, quote, real social equality. The democratic republic does not do away with the opposition of the proletariat and the capitalist class. On the contrary, it provides the clear field on which the fight can be fought out. And in the same way, the peculiar character of the supremacy of the husband over the wife in the modern family, the necessity of creating real social equality between them and the way to do it, will only be seen in the clear light of day when both possess legally complete equality of rights. End quote. Although generally consistent with Marx's sketch of the reproduction of labor power, Engels' consideration of women's oppression is flawed or incomplete in several critical respects. In the first place, he assumes that it is natural for, quote, family duties to be the exclusive province of women, and that therefore they always will be. Furthermore, he does not clearly link the development of a special sphere associated with the reproduction of labor power to the emergence of class, or perhaps capitalist society. For pre-capitalist class societies, he fails to specify the nature of women's subordination in different classes. Finally, Engel's emphasis on the strategic importance of democratic rights leaves open the question of the relationship between socialist revolution, women's liberation, and the struggle for equal rights. The result is ambiguous, potentially suggesting that the socialist program for women's liberation consists of two discrete objectives, equal rights with men in the still capitalist short term, and full liberation on the basis of a higher form of the family in the far distant revolutionary millennium. Engels closes the chapter on the family with a long look to the future. Footnote. The subjects of love and sexuality are covered at even greater length by Babel. End footnote. These pages trace, yet again, the development of monogamy on the basis of private property, and attempt a sketch of family experience in a society in which the means of production have been converted into social property. True monogamy, that is, monogamy for the man as well as the woman, will now be possible, along with wide development of that highest of intimate emotions, individual sex love. Exactly what relations between the sexes will look like cannot be predicted, for it is up to a new generation of women and men born and raised in socialist society. Quote, when these people are in the world, they will care precious little what anybody today thinks they ought to do. They will make their own practice, 
and their corresponding public opinion about the practice of each individual, and that will be the end of it. End quote. Engel's focus on the emotional and sexual content of interpersonal relations within the family household reflected a common view that they represent the essence of the so-called woman question. Only at one point in this section does he dwell on the implications of the future abolition of the family's economic functions. Observing that with the means of production held in common, quote, the single family ceases to be the economic unit of society. Private housekeeping is transformed into a social industry, end quote. Moreover, quote, the care and education of the children becomes a public affair, end quote. These brief hints offer the barest programmatic guidance, and do not differ, in substance, from 19th century communitarian proposals. In short, Engel's chapter on the family in The Origin remains an unintegrated mix of Morgan's dry materialism and a radical view of sexual liberation, seasoned with genuine insights into the nature of property and social relations, and liberally sprinkled with Engel's warmth and wit. In chapters 3-8 to eight of The Origin, corresponding to the section on government in Morgan's ancient society, Engels examines the nature of clan society and traces the rise of the state. As in chapter 2 on the family, he follows Morgan's general line of argument, while at the same time focusing it and integrating the material on property. In Engels' words, the changes in form between the institutions of the Gentile constitution and those of the state, quote, have been outlined by Morgan, but their economic content and cause must largely be added by myself, end quote. The resulting discussion suffers from defects similar to those already observed in Engel's account of the family. Moreover, it becomes more obvious in these chapters that Engels identifies private property and the market exchange of commodities as the pivotal social developments in history. Nowhere, however, does he clearly discuss these phenomena in terms of the social relations that constitute the mode of production in which they originate. In these chapters, a critique of property takes the place of a critique of class relations. Property, not exploitation, the appropriation of the surplus labor of the producing class by another class, becomes the implicit object of class struggle. From the point of view of Marx's theory of social reproduction, however, both private property and commodity exchange only represent specific manifestations of particular types of class society. In such societies, a given set of relations of exploitation always dominates, constituting the basis for specific social relations and forms of private property, the market, the state, and so forth. The difference between this formulation and that in the origin is crucial and not simply a matter of style or manner of exposition. It reveals that the argument put forth by Engels in The Origin generally remain within the theoretical framework of a utopian critique of property. Marx's comments about his favorite utopian socialist target, Proudhon, would apply equally to Engels. He should have analyzed, quote, property relations as a whole, not in their legal expression as relations of volition, but in their real form, that is, as relations of production. Instead, he has entangled the whole of these economic relations in the general juristic conception of, quote, property, end quote. Furthermore, Engels has confused the circumstance that the products of labor are exchanged in a society with the presence of capitalist, or at least class, relations of production. In The Origin's Closing Chapter 9, Barbarism and Civilization, Engels examines the general economic conditions behind the developments presented in previous chapters. Here, he observes, we shall need Marx's capital as much as Morgan's book. Unfortunately, it is already far too late, for the analytical weaknesses encountered throughout The Origin permeate this highly repetitive chapter. Engels restates his account of social evolution in the period of the decline of clan society and the emergence of civilization, this time pointing out a series of major milestones. In the middle stages of barbarism, the separation of pastoral tribes from the mass of other peoples marks the, quote, 
first great social division of labor. These tribes tame animals and develop agriculture. As a result, they soon find themselves with products that make regular exchange possible. Inevitably and automatically, the increasing exchange leads to higher productivity, more wealth, and a society in which the harnessing of surplus labor becomes feasible. Hence, slavery appears. Quote, From the first great social division of labor arose the first great cleavage of society into two classes, masters and slaves, exploiters and exploited. End quote. Engels reminds the reader that the change in the division of labor also has consequences for relations between the sexes and the family. Because the pre-existing division of labor had supposedly assigned the task of procuring subsistence to men, men become the holders of the new wealth, and women find themselves subordinated and confined to private domestic labor. A, quote, second grade division of labor occurs at the close of the period of barbarism, when handicraft separates from agriculture. On this basis, a new cleavage of society into classes develops, the opposition between rich and poor. Inequalities of property among individual male heads of families now lead to the breakup of the communal household, and the pairing marriage dissolves into the monogamous single family, even more oppressive to women. Finally, a third division of labor emerges in the period of civilization. A class of merchants arises, parasites whose nefarious activities lead to periodic trade crises. In the meantime, the rise of class cleavages has necessitated replacement of the Gentile constitution with a third force, powerful but apparently above the class struggle, namely the state. In sum, the concluding chapter of The Origin argues that civilization results from the continual evolution of the division of labor, which in turn gives rise to exchange, commodity production, class cleavages, the subordination of women, the single family as the economic unit of society, and the state. What is wrong with this picture is that Engels has once again simply listed phenomena without rooting them in social relations and the workings of a dominant mode of production. Moreover, he awards the leading role to the technical division of labor in the labor process, what Morgan had considered under the rubric, quote, arts of subsistence. The development of class cleavages, that is, of exploitative social relations, simply follows automatically once a certain level of material productivity is reached. In other words, the state of the forces of production mechanistically determines the nature of the relations of production. The emphasis on the technical division of labor in this chapter constitutes a new element, tending somewhat to replace the focus in earlier chapters on the rise of private property as the prime mover of social change. At the same time, Engels, like Morgan, often invokes innate human greed and competitiveness to explain historical development. All in all, the scattered analysis of social development presented in this final chapter represents some of the weakest reasoning in The Origin. Not surprisingly, The Origin's summary comments in this chapter on the emancipation of women exhibit similar ambiguities. Engels emphasizes, yet again, the crushing impact made by the first great social division of labor on women's position, and then leaps to a supposedly self-evident conclusion beginning of long quote. We can already see from this that to emancipate woman and make her the equal of man is and remains an impossibility, so long as the woman is shut out from social productive labor and restricted to private domestic labor. The emancipation of woman will only be possible when woman can take part in production on a large social scale, and domestic work no longer claims anything but an insignificant amount of her time. And only now has that become possible through modern large-scale industry, which does not merely permit the employment of female labor over a wide range, but positively demands it, while it also tends toward ending private domestic labor by changing it more and more into a public industry. End quote. As in the chapter on the family, Engels here assumes that domestic labor is purely woman's work. 
does not locate his statement with respect to a specific class society, and blurs the relationship between women's eventual liberation in communist society and immediate strategic goals. Engels formulates the relationship between social transformation and women's equality more specifically in a letter written in 1885. Quote, It is my conviction that real equality of women and men can come true only when the exploitation of either by capital has been abolished and private housework has been transformed into a public industry. End quote. In the meantime, protective legislation is necessary. Quote, that the working woman needs special protection against capitalist exploitation because of her special physiological functions seems obvious to me. I admit I am more interested in the health of the future generations than in the absolute formal equality of the sexes during the last years of the capitalist mode of production. End quote. Once again, Engels wrestles with the problem of distinguishing juridical equality from real social equality. Engels made one argument in The Origin that the socialist movement later refused to endorse, but which has recently been taken up by theorists of the contemporary women's liberation movement. In a frequently cited passage from the 1884 preface to The Origin, Engels spoke of two types of production proceeding in parallel. On the one hand, the production of the means of subsistence, and on the other, the production of human beings. The dualistic formulation strikingly recalls the never-published German ideology of 1846, in which Marx and Engels had suggested a similar characterization of the dual essence of social reproduction. Quote, the production of life, both of one's own labor and of fresh life in procreation, appears as a twofold relation, on the one hand as a natural, on the other hand as a social relation. End quote. The dependence of the origin on the 40-year-old German ideology is not limited to this dramatic linguistic parallel. Engels drew quite heavily on the forgotten manuscript of his and Marx's youth, which he had just rediscovered among Marx's papers. Thus, both texts make a relatively sharp distinction between natural and social phenomena, emphasizing the purely biological or animal-like character of procreation. Furthermore, the German ideology assigns, as does the origin, a central motivating role in social development to the continual evolution of the division of labor. According to the German ideology, society develops in stages, beginning from the simplest forms, in which the only division of labor is natural and rooted in the sexual act. With the growth of the division of labor, social relations distinguish themselves from natural ones and the family relation becomes subordinate. Both the German ideology and the origin refer to the development, at this point in history, of a relationship of latent slavery within the family, representing, quote, the first form of property. Finally, both texts put forth an equivocal image of the family as a germ or nucleus within which larger social contradictions originate or are reflected, and which itself constitutes the fundamental building block of society. Engels' extensive reliance on the German ideology has the effect of importing into the origin many of the theoretical weaknesses of the earlier manuscript. In 1846, when Marx and Engels composed the German ideology, they had been on the threshold of two lifetimes of profound contributions to the socialist movement. The manuscript bears, nonetheless, the marks of its very early place in their development. Thus, when Engels, in the preface to The Origin, echoes the dichotomy suggested in The German Ideology by positing two separate systems of production of material life, he simply takes a very primitive distinction between natural and social phenomena to its logical conclusion. His return to this dichotomy, long after he, and even more so, Marx, had generally transcended it in subsequent work, epitomizes the theoretical ambiguity found throughout the origin. Socialists at the turn of the century found the preface's assertion concerning the duality of social reproduction very remarkable, indeed almost incomprehensible. 
Soviet commentators eventually settled on the view that Engels was mistaken, and that the statement can only refer to the very earliest period of human history, when people were supposedly so much a part of nature that social relations of production could not be said to exist. Footnote. On the turn of the century socialists, see Geiger. Similar opinions have been expressed more recently in Heinness and Hearst. On the Soviet view, see Stern. For other critiques of the dualism implicit in the origin, see Brown and O'Loughlin. End footnote. What disturbed these theorists was the implication that the family represents an autonomous, if not wholly independent, center of development. And it is precisely this implication that has caught the imagination of contemporary socialist feminists, often tempting them into a quite cavalier reading of the origin. Engel's purpose in writing The Origin was to, quote, present the results of Morgan's researches in the light of the conclusions of Marx's materialist examination of history, and thus to make clear their full significance, end quote. Engel's treatment of the material falls short, however, of this goal, for he only partially transforms Morgan's crude materialism. The Origin is marred throughout by Engel's failure to base the discussion on an adequate exposition of Marx's theory of social development. Instead, Engels relies, quite erratically, on several theoretical frameworks in addition to his understanding of Marx's work. The technological determinism implicit in Morgan's ancient society, his main source of data, the German ideology's early version of historical materialism, and a generally utopian critique of property and view of the socialist future. While the origin manages, in places, to rise above this eclecticism, its theoretical weaknesses and omissions were to have serious consequences. The origin constituted a defective text whose ambiguous theoretical and political formulations nevertheless became an integral part of the socialist legacy. End of section.